Good afternoon, everyone. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to what is a very special part of the conference. This is where the fine academic traditions of the college meet the annual gathering of GPs in the United Kingdom. It reminds us that we're an academic body and on our chains, Helen's chain and my chain, the emblems represent learning, research, burning the midnight oil, scholarship and wisdom. So I'm pleased to say that today we have our prestigious John Hunt Lecture. This is one of three eponymous lectures of the college, the first being the Mackenzie Lecture, which is traditionally given on a clinical topic, the second one being the Pickles Lecture, which is given on a topic related to education, and finally the John Hunt Lecture. So this is given traditionally by someone who is not a GP. They're specially selected, and the selection is in the gift of the president, and is given only once in the term of a president. It's given and chosen on the basis of an important message for society, for the public, and for general practitioners as leaders. The lecturer is presented with a silver uh, medal, which I will do shortly, and the lecture is published in the British Journal of General Practice, subject to editorial uh, right. I always have to add that because we give our editor full editorial independence. By convention, there are no questions after the lecture, but I'm very pleased to say that the lecturer will be available to talk to people afterwards and is also joining the conference dinner uh, later on. So this is a young lecture for the college. 1992, it was founded on the 40th anniversary of the college. And you know why it, why it was founded? Because that is the year, a year after we established the first ever patients liaison group in any medical royal college. And in keeping with that tradition, it was decided to invite a member of the public to give such a lecture. The first lecture was given by the Prince of Wales in 1992 in Dean's Yard, Westminster. And just a couple of, um, reflections about John Hunt, who was a very able president of the college and of course a founder of our college together with Fraser Rose. Those of you who have breakfast at the college on the third floor will see the two portraits looking at each other. So this, they represent the founders of our college. He was a visionary, visionary man. He was the only GP or the last GP to go to the House of Lords where he championed seat belt legislation. How cool is that? Incredible. He grew up in India, and I was fascinated by this fact because, you know, we, we all love pets, don't we? So shall we get a dog or a cat or... And John Hunt had a pet. He had a bear as a pet. <laughs> and his pet bear grew so big that his parents were concerned that it would actually eat him. And the bear was given to a zoo. So... Um, Remarkable, remarkable general practitioner of his time. So now to the lecturer uh, uh, himself. So it's Professor Sir Michael Marmot, uh, who's Professor of Epidemiology at one of Britain's leading universities, University College London. He has so many awards, it would take me like two hours to read all those, but I was impressed that he has 18 honorary doctorates which is the largest number that I've ever come across. Um, he was knighted in the year 2000. He's of course an honorary fellow of our college. And the reason I chose him to give this lecture was because of his epoch-making work on social gradients in health. Can I therefore invite Sir Michael Marmot to the stage to receive the medal and give the lecture. Your bio is like 10 pages.
doubly pleased, actually, firstly, to do this, but secondly, when the president said, I get the medal before I give the lecture. <laughs> you mean I could do a runner? <laughs> and that means I'm doing the lecture because I want to, not because I'm rewarded for doing it. It's an absolute pleasure to talk to you. And I've been working in this vineyard of social justice, health equity, and the social determinants of health all of my life. John Hunt, who was just introduced to us, had this phrase, he said, I had far rather start with a big idea in a small way than a small idea in a big way. I didn't know that. And in a way, that's what I did. So if you'll forgive a minor bit of indulgence, let me go back into my ancient history. I did my PhD at the University of California, Berkeley. I finished it in 1975. Don't ask how old I am. Um, it was a study of men of Japanese ancestry living in Japan, Hawaii, and California. And as the Japanese migrate across the Pacific, the rate of heart disease goes up higher in Hawaii than in Japan and higher in California. It's a statement that the social environment is key. And indeed, I looked at the Japanese in California, and the more westernized, the more acculturated they were, the higher the rate of heart disease. What I later came to call the social determinants of health, the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age, are fundamental. If you thought that somehow the Japanese were protected for genetic reasons, you'd have to argue that those who migrated were genetically different. And if you got half a dose of the gene for migration, you got as far as Hawaii. And if you got the full dose, you got all the way to California. More likely, and that's what I showed among the California Japanese, is that it's social relationships, the environment in which you are born, grow, live, work, and age. And then I came back to the UK and got involved in the Whitehall studies. We saw a social gradient. The higher the rank in the civil service hierarchy, the lower the mortality, the longer the life expectancy. I said at the time, given how long lived were the top administrators, that a top level administrator in the British Civil Service was the perfect biological specimen <laughs> with the end point of Darwinian evolution. There he is, perfection. <laughs> Little did I know that this was going to get me involved one way or another, in trying to formulate policies as to what we could do about the social gradients in health. As I'll say in a few moments, when one day I asked myself, what if we tried to do something about the evidence? And that led me to chair various commissions, and I summarized them in my book, The Health Gap, the opening line of which was why treat people and send them back to the conditions that made them sick. I think it's important to summarize the evidence. I think it's important to try and influence policy and practice. A young member of my extended family said to me one, quite recently, is anyone listening to you? <laughs> I thought this young fellow is going to go a long way. <laughs> it's a good question. Is anyone listening to you? Well, I like to have evidence for any assertion I make. So forgive me a bit of evidence. The Italian translation of my book uh, came out as La Salute Disuguale. Only the Italians would have that on the cover. <laughs> In fact, the Trento 
Festival of Economics, Trento in Northern Italy, Festival of Economics, had as its theme a couple of years ago, La Salute Disuguale. And I'd been invited to go and talk, and I'd quite forgotten that that was the theme of the conference. And I got there, and I saw these signs all over the town saying La Salute Disuguale. I thought, that's familiar. <laughs> and then I saw the... <laughs> So I had to get a photo taken, <laughs> which I sent to my children. And one of my sons came back and said, I think the cutout looks better than the original. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> that's why you have children. <laughs> and to answer my young relative, is anyone listening? Crossword of La Repubblica. The clue, 146 down, British physician, founder of social epidemiology. <coughs> I don't know if I can put that on my CV. But <laughs> so someone's listening. <laughs> and we've been trying to monitor what's been happening to health, health inequalities, and the social determinants of health. And the, the monitoring is a vital part of what we do. And you may have noticed, we reported a couple of years ago, this phenomenon. Life expectancy in England had improved about one year every four years since the end of World War I. From 1921 to 2011, life expectancy improved one year every four years. Six hours every 24 hours. If you came to this conference for six hours today, <laughs> You've got it for nothing. Your life expectancy at the end of it is as long as it was at the beginning. Actually, probably longer because it was probably enhanced by all that you got from the conference. And then in 2011, it stopped. Dramatic change in the curve. The press got quite interested in this. I spent one of those days, you start with the BBC in the morning and so on. And towards the end of the day, I saw a tweet from the health secretary at the time, it was Jeremy Hunt, remember him? Um, <laughs> and he tweeted, respect Marmot. Actually, he had no punctuation, so I don't know if it was respect Marmot. Um, <laughs> respect Marmot, but since he was on the BBC this morning, life expectancy for men has increased by 61 minutes. I scratched my head and I tweeted back, what are you saying? That the Office for National Statistics got its sums wrong? If ONS got it right, let's discuss. And somebody tweeted, ooh, Jeremy Hans picked a fight with Marmot. <laughs> <laughs> My money's on Marmot. <laughs> <laughs> and I wrote to the health secretary and said, you should take this slowdown in the improvement in life expectancy as seriously as you would a winter bed crisis. And he did. He ignored them both. <laughs> I am not in the least party political. <laughs> One of the questions we got asked was, well, it's going to slow down sometime. Maybe we've just reached peak life expectancy. Well, we looked across Europe, and if you compare 2006, 2010, and the subsequent five years, indeed, life expectancy increase slowed in all of these European countries. And that's consistent with the global financial crisis and the policies of austerity that were put in place, consequent to the global financial crisis. But there's the UK. This is women. There's the UK. Bottom. The most marked slowdown of any European country. So it was not the case that we'd simply reach peak life expectancy because European countries that had longer life expectancy than us continued to increase further. More recent data looked at life expectancy at birth 
And for women, in the bot this is deciles of deprivation. And in the bottom five deciles, life expectancy declined for women and was pretty flat for men. So the inequalities got much bigger. And one of the questions I asked when we saw this, are we going the way of the United States? Life expectancy at that time had declined two years in a row, declined two years in a row in the US. Now it's three years in a row in the US. And this huge increase in unintentional injuries, which include accidental drug overdose. In 2016, there were 63,600 deaths. 2017, that was 70,000 deaths from accidental poisonings. Happily, we have not had the opioid epidemic that the US has, but it's starting to show. We're now starting to see an increased mortality in younger and middle ages in the UK. And that huge increase, and by the way, suicide also on the increase, and that huge increase in drug overdoses and suicide and also in alcohol-related disorders in the US is consistent with saying that the mind is an important gateway <coughs> by to which social circumstances impact on health. There's mental illness and well-being and psychosocial pathways to physical illness through behaviors and stress pathways. And what's been happening to inequalities in the US? Firstly, there's a gradient. This is men, life expectancy at age 50 by deciles of income. So people who were born in 1920 will be 50 in 1970. People who were born in 1950 will be 50 in 2000. And these are deciles of income. And you can see the gradient. The lower the income, the shorter the life expectancy. And it's a graded phenomenon. It's like our civil servants. And over the next 30 years, life expectancy improved just a tiny bit for the bottom 10% of income. It improved a bit more for the next 10%, more, 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 more. more. So the gradient got much steeper. The inequalities got much bigger. Now that's men. You've had a nice day today, I understand. It's Friday afternoon. I don't want to ruin your day. I think perhaps I ought to get informed consent before I show you the next slide. <laughs> you feeling resilient, <laughs> strong. This is women. expectancy went down for the bottom 10%. Life expectancy went down for the next 10%. Life expectancy went down for the third decile. For the bottom 30% in the income distribution, life expectancy for women declined. And the inequalities got dramatically bigger. You're doing fine if you're up there. You're not doing fine if you're in the bottom 30%. Fundamental to everything I've been doing, <coughs> and it was fundamental to what I've been doing before I realized it was, is that health is telling us something really important about how well society is meeting the needs of its citizens. If health is not improving, something is going wrong. And if inequalities in health are increasing, then inequalities in society are increasing. And that's why I wrote to the health secretary and said, you need to take this seriously. What could be more important than this? And I think we do understand something of what might have led to it. When I asked myself the question, what if they took the research seriously? Well, one thing led to another and they turned out to be me, and I chaired the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health. 
And we said on the cover, social injustice is killing on a grand scale. Slightly unusual for a WHO report. Ministers of Health turned up to the WHO World Health Assembly and said that they're talking about us. Social injustice, that they're saying we are perpetrators of social injustice. Well, we said social injustice is killing on a grand scale. And we said fundamental is empowerment of individuals, of communities, and indeed of whole societies. And I saw empowerment as having three dimensions. Material, if you can't feed your children, how can you be empowered? Psychosocial, having control over your life, and political, having voice. And we said we need to improve the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. And that is shaped by inequities in power, money, and resources. And following the WHO Commission, Gordon Brown, who was Prime Minister at the time, commissioned me to do a review of health inequalities in England. The question was, how could we apply the findings and recommendations of your global commission to one country, England? And it was published as the Marmot Review in 2010, and we're now doing a 10-year follow-up, which we hope to publish in February 2020 to say what's happened in the last 10 years. So Marmot Review 10 years on. And then the European region of WHO asked me to lead a commission for Europe. And last week, no, on the 1st of October, we published the commission of the Pan American Health Organization on equity and health inequalities in the Americas. And we called our report Just Societies health equity, and dignified lives. It was saying if we can create the conditions for people to lead dignified lives, health will improve and the cause of health equity will be advanced. Coming back to my English review, we had six domains of recommendations. Give every child the best start in life, education and lifelong learning, Employment and working conditions. Number four, wow, how radical is, can that be? Everyone should have enough money to live on. They should be able to pay the rent and buy food. Five, healthy and sustainable communities in which to live and work. And six, taking a social determinants approach to prevention, recognizing that smoking follows the social gradient. Obesity follows the social gradient and the like. Let me, I'm not going to go through all of them because much as I would like it, we'd be here till Saturday morning. Um, so, but let me touch on it. So give every child the best start in life. I said we've been monitoring. And one of the indicators that we've been looking at is the percent of children age five that have a good level of development. Look at the blue dots. Ignore the red for the moment. Look at the blue dots. That's the average. So it's the percent of children in each local authority who have a good level of development age five. And the local authorities are classified by the level of deprivation. So to the right, as you look at it, are the more affluent. And what you see is the more affluent the local authority, the higher the proportion of children age five with a good level of development. One way to reduce inequalities in early child development is to reduce deprivation. Bring those local authorities up towards the middle and the proportion of children with good level of development will go up. I'm sure I don't need to convince you why that's important to health inequalities. Because a good start in life then predicts how you're going to do in school, which in turn predicts whether you get qualifications, which predicts the kind of job, how much money, where you live, and the like, which of course tells us a lot about health inequalities. 
but they scatter around the line. For a given level of deprivation, some local authorities are doing better than others. Aha. Uh -huh. Can we break the link between deprivation and poor early child development? So now, look at the red dots. The red dots are children eligible for free school meals. I was talking to a colleague at UCL one night this week, and she predicted this. She hadn't seen the data, and she predicted this. So I thought, you're cleverer than me. I got it completely wrong. I got it completely upside down. She said, the poor kids will do better in poor areas. I thought the poor kids would do much better. They'd benefit from all those rich kids around them. It's the opposite. The poorer the area, the better do the poor children do. I really looked at her with real respect. I thought, how did you know that? Well, you know, she had good reasons. Anyway, she was right. That's what the data show. And look, there's England. 60% of children have a good level of development. The children eligible for free school meals, just under 45%. The gap is just under 16%. Hackney, I know, it's gentrifying, but there's still a lot of poor kids. I mean, I've got children who live in Hackney, and once French cheese appeared in the local shop, you know, <laughs> there goes the neighbourhood. But, um, but there's still a lot of poor kids. The kids eligible for free school meals, 61%. They do as well as the English average. And the gap between the poor children and the average is only 4%. In Hackney, they closed the gap. The director of education said, we tell ourselves every day, poverty is not destiny. That's what we do when we get up in the morning. In Bath, the northeast Somerset, the gap's 30%. I caught the train to South Wales and it stopped in Bath Spa. I'm very tempted to call out, what do you do for poor kids in Bath? <laughs> and I'm hearing voices and the voice said, poor kids, we didn't know we had any. And that might well be the issue. So it's quite possible to break the link between deprivation and poor child performance. We could also reduce deprivation. This is the percent of children in poverty, where poverty is defined as less than 60% median income. In Denmark, it's 9%, Iceland, 10 So in the Nordic countries, it's 9 to 11%. In the UK, it's just under 20%. In the United States, it's 29%, just under Mexico. I was lecturing in the US, and I showed them this figure and said, you live in a democracy. This must be the level of child poverty that you want. Otherwise, you'd elect a government that did something different. And I got the reaction some of you are giving me. <laughs> I said, the real, the, the real scandal is not what that orange nightmare in the White House did with a porn star. The real <laughs> pornography is this high level of child poverty. <laughs> the other side of early childhood, so there's the good side, good early child development, and getting children with a good level of development. The bad side are adverse child experiences. And ACEs, adverse child experiences, all follow the social gradient. Incarceration, drug abuse, sexual abuse, alcohol abuse, and so on. Each of these adverse child experiences is more frequent the lower the income. And they have a huge impact. People with four or more adverse child experiences, early sex, if you could eliminate ad four adverse child experiences, you could reduce it by a third, unintended teen pregnancy by 38%, smoking, binge drinking, cannabis. Look at this, violence perpetration, half 
the perpetrators of domestic violence had four or more adverse child experiences. And even more chilling, half the victims of domestic violence had four or more adverse child experiences. And they follow the social gradient. <coughs> and that relates to ensuring a healthy standard of living. You know the rhetoric, you've heard it. The poor are feckless, they're irresponsible. They're living the life of Riley on welfare. They can't be bothered to work. You heard all that, remember? That nice, cuddly editor of the Evening Standard when he was Chancellor of the Exchequer. Um, well, 2016-17, these are people in poverty, and those are in workless households. And you can see the majority of people in poverty are in a household where at least one adult is working. These people are in poverty not because they're irresponsible. They're in poverty because they're lowly paid. And that relates to nutrition. The Food Foundation calculated that if people followed Public Health England's healthy eating advice, those in the bottom 10% of income would have to spend 74% of household income on food. So when you tell your patients, eat healthily, more fruit and vegetables, yeah, well, who'll pay the rent? Housing is a food issue. Poverty is a food issue. How can these people eat healthily if it would take 74% of household income? They're well off in Scotland. It would only take 68%. One thing we could do is get some more money into the system. Tax havens increase inequality. 50% of the wealth in tax havens belongs to the top 0.01% of people in advanced economies. That wealth is equivalent to 5% of global GDP. It's tax avoidance on a massive scale. And added to that is avoidance of tax by multinationals. 50% of the wealth in tax havens belongs, sorry, 600 billion euros a year shifted to the world's tax havens by multinationals. You remember when the Commons Public Accounts Committee got the head of Starbucks and Google and one or two others, and they asked, why don't you pay tax? And Starbucks said, because we don't make a profit. Ah, oh, isn't that sweet? Isn't that nice? <laughs> Starbucks is selling coffee for the well-being of the British public, and they don't make a profit. I looked at how do they not make a profit? Turns out they buy their coffee beans from the Netherlands. The ne have you been to the Netherlands? They grow, <laughs> they grow tulips in the Netherlands. <laughs> they have moo cows. They don't grow coffee beans. They grow accountants. <laughs> so this is an accounting trick. Of course it's expensive to buy coffee beans from the Netherlands because they don't grow them there. They grow them in Costa Rica and Brazil and normal places. But there's counting mechanisms. One of the things we could do if we stop Brexit is try and get rid of tax avoidance. But <laughs> And housing matters for health. I said housing was a food issue. Look at this, childhood poverty in London, where poverty is less than 60% median income. Before housing costs, 17% of children are in poverty. After housing costs, 37%. Poverty relates to poor housing. Poor housing relates to poverty, and they relate to food. The Lancet, I'm, I used to be a serious scientist. Now the Lancet asked me to review picture exhibitions and 
plays and books and God knows what, so, which is fun, actually. So they asked me to go to Bedrooms of London. It was an exhibition of Bedrooms of London. The cot, the bed, kitchen table. Emily Martin and their baby sleep on the sofa bed in the living room where they eat. The three other children in the bedroom. Martin's in work, earns 800 pounds a month. Outside, older kids compete for drugs, clientele. They leave knives in the bushes where younger children play hide and seek. Four children, three teenagers and a nine-year-old in one room, mum and dad in the other. Both parents work, but they still have to have their rent subsidised. And the mother says, the area is full of gangs. I want my children to, lead, to live in a safe place. There are kids around the building that don't go to school. I call this one everything and the kitchen sink. Can you see the size of this place? There's the cot. And that's for Emily and her daughter. Her partner left when she was five months pregnant. She said, at the beginning, I didn't have benefits, so I didn't have food. I was crying for no reason. For no reason. She puts a towel under the door to stop the marijuana smoke from getting in. A Nigerian mother, an English father, and three children in a two-bedroom flat. And she said, to know that somebody somewhere is making something available for you to be happy. My feeling welcome in this country has been all through charities. What does it mean to you to have a government that is uncaring, that as a matter of policy is uncaring? And if... It says it's uncaring because if it were caring, it would encourage more people. That means it's treating individual people as an instrument of public policy, which is immoral. We don't do that. So are these people feckless? Are they choosing the easy life of welfare dependence? And one mother said, nobody falls into this on purpose because your whole life is going to be a trap, a trap. And then you will see yourself living a life you never thought you would. That's all pretty miserable. I get moved by when people triumph over adversity. <coughs> over the last small number of years, I've got interested in the health of indigenous peoples. We made a great deal of it in our PAHO review in the Americas, indigenous peoples in the Americas, and in Australia. The gap in life expectancy between Australian Aboriginals and Torres Strait Islanders and non-indigenous is 10.6 years for men, 9.4 years for women. And people have thrown up their hands and said, on one trip to Australia, I was asked by a journalist, I just got off the plane, we've spent billions on this, and we seem to make no difference. What should we be doing? I said, I just got off the plane. <laughs> <laughs> I'm jet lagged. I'll tell you tomorrow. <laughs> well, I was taken in Western Sydney to a shed. It was a shed. Aboriginal men have a very high rate of suicide. And the founder of the shed, and these Aboriginal men are involved in it, the founder of the shed said the conventional wisdom is that men get depressed and suicidal because they won't talk about their feelings. The approach we took, he said, is that men get depressed and suicidal, Aboriginal men, because they're homeless, because they're in poverty, because they're socially isolated, because they've had their children taken away from them. And then they get involved in this cycle of child removal, isolation, drug and alcohol abuse, depression, and death. So they set this center up 
to deal with the social determinants of suicide. And it is inspiring. And then they took me to the Tharawal Aboriginal Corporation, southwest of Sydney, run by Aboriginal people, for Aboriginal people, the popular belly cast program. So Aboriginal women, when they're pregnant, don't attend antenatal classes. So they got women to make plaster casts of their pregnant torsos and decorate them with Aboriginal art. They're really lovely, <laughs> lovely. And the women love it. So they get them in. They have educational gatherings before pregnancy, during and after the birth of the baby, and on it goes. And the children get involved, and the families get involved in various child development programs. Drug and alcohol problems. Grannies against removal. I said, are you talking about the lost generation? As you may know, there was a vogue in Australia public policy to remove Aboriginal children from their families, bring them up in institutions to try and breed the Aboriginal out of them. And it was a disaster for the children. It was a disaster for the families. And they said to me, it's still going on. The default position of social services in Australia is that Aboriginal parents are incompetent. The question is not, should you remove the children from the parents, but when? That's the default position, and it's calamitous. And they're saying, keep our children with us. And I saw in Victoria an Aboriginal community-controlled healthcare organisation that said, we've taken responsibility. We take responsibility to keep the children with the families. We deal with the drug and alcohol. It costs $100,000 a year to take a child in care. I said to them, surely for $100,000 a year you could deal with the drug and alcohol problems of the parents. And they said, we're doing it. Well... I was asked by the ABC, the Australian Broadcasting Commission, to do the Australian version of the Wreath Lectures, the Boyer Lectures, it's called. And they had a public affairs program. It's not, it's not called Question Time, it's called Q&A, but it's Question Time. And on the program, so with, they had me on it to trail the lectures, and on the program, I was asked something about income distribution. And I said, what do the following groups have in common? The 48 million people who make up the population of Tanzania. The 7 million people who make up the population of Paraguay. The 2 million people who make up the population of Latvia. And the top earning 25 hedge fund managers in New York. And the answer is, the previous year, each of those groups had a combined income of $25 billion. And I said, what if the hedge fund managers gave up their income for one year? They wouldn't miss it. They're going to make a billion dollars each the next year. And we took that $25 billion and transferred it to Tanzania. We doubled the per capita income. And I'm not suggesting simply giving the cash to individual Tanzanians, although that probably wouldn't be a bad thing to do. But think of the clean cook stoves, the clean water, the nurses and teachers you could employ. And someone else on the panel looked at me and said, you're in fantasy land, mate. You're in complete fantasy land. That's never going to happen. I was a bit flabbergasted. Uh, I managed to say something about Haftan Mahler, the former director general of WHO, said the utopians of today are the realists of tomorrow. But still, the next day I went to the Tharawal Community Center and I was greeted by one of the doctors. So I say to you, 
Welcome to my fantasy land, and let's create a fairer world.